Yeah, so instead of making more slides, I thought it might be more fun to do this video on tips and tricks to make GANs work a little bit more interactive. That is, um, yeah, I will walk you through a list, a very nice list of tips and tricks. And then we will see in the code that we seen last video how or if I used these tricks. Okay, so this list is based on a GitHub repository by Sumit Chintala. Uh, Sumit Chintala is a researcher at Facebook AI Research and um, yeah, is also one of the main PyTorch developers and also back in 2016 worked on the Wasserstein GAN, which is a very popular version of the GAN. So here in this uh, list, there are, I think, 17 tips. So I wanted to walk through them step by step. It says that this list is no longer maintained. Um, and he says he's not sure whether it's still relevant in 2020, but actually most of the tips are still very useful. So they are really useful starter tips for GANs, even though the list is not maintained anymore. So let's look at them one at a time. So normalizing the inputs, normalize the images between minus one and one range and using 10H in the last layer of the generator output. So that is something I actually did. So here I normalized the images in minus one, one range. And then I also had my 10H here. By the way, I was writing this code before I looked at the list. So everything is just a poor coincidence uh, or based on something I've heard before that seems to work well in practice. So then in GAN papers, the loss function is to optimize uh, it as follows, but in practice we do the maximization uh, and then we flip the labels when training the generator. This is for, um, the, the whole thing is for the generator, the modified loss function. And this is also what we extensively talked about. So when we go back here, this is essentially what we talked about when we flip this one minus into just, yeah, the output and then we also flip the labels that was right here so yeah we are also using that trick that was also in the code um, using a spherical z so instead of sampling the noise from a uniform distribution we are sampling from a yeah a gaussian distribution and as that's also something i did when we revisit training code here so I think it was at the bottom somewhere training GAN. So yeah, we used a random normal distribution and not a uniform distribution. All right, next, using batch norm. So when using batch norm, it's, so I'm actually not using batch norm in this code, but I will show you in the next video, my code for the setup A face image data set where I was writing a convolutional GAN and there I used batch norm. And here the trick or tip is about not mixing the real and generated images. So here the recommendation is um, keeping them separate. So training the discriminator on a batch of real and a batch of generated instead of mixing real and generated. And that is also something we did. So when we go back to the code here, um, right here, so we have fake images and we have well, the real the real images are up here real images and fake images and we f uh, feed them to the discriminator separately so first we get the real images and then the fake images we don't mix them together okay next avoiding sparse gradients using um, leaky redu so yeah like we talked about before the redu can have these dead neurons that's uh, lecture, I think lecture five, six, something like that. Or was it later? It could have been nine when we talked about activation functions and we talked about the dead relu problem. And yeah, uh, if we have a generator that should generate something, maybe using a regular relu is not a great idea. So using relu here, actually in both in G uh, and D, the generator and the discriminator might be a good idea. So let's check whether we use that. Yep, I have leaky relu here. Next for downsampling, use average pooling. Okay, this is something I have not done. So this is actually, it will be in my next. Let me just double check. No, I don't have done that. Okay, that might be 
that might be something to consider to improve my code using average pooling and um, for upsampling conf transpose plus stride that is something i used pixel shuffle might also be an additional interesting trick which we may find here in this paper um, using soft noisy labels that is something i have tried in the past it worked a, a little bit better i think so um wasn't that much better about slightly better i haven't done this in this code because yeah, i didn't I didn't keep in mind everything, but if you want to play around with that, it's another interesting thing to do. So instead of using one for real, we use random numbers between 0.7 and uh, 1.2 to make the labels a little bit softer, or not softer, but to, yeah, instead of having these fixed numbers, having some uncertainty around them. And then for the fake ones, to use the numbers between 0 um, and 0.3. Actually, when I did that, I had like a slight so I only had the soft labels, not the noisy labels. So I only had like, instead of one, I had a 0.9 instead of zero, I had a 0.1 and it helped a little bit. So I haven't tried this range before or this range, 0.3. So it might be something interesting to try. And there's also another thing here, um, making the labels noisy for the discriminator by occasionally flipping them. I also heard this works very well in practice to improve the discriminator so it doesn't um, become too good. So you kind of shake it up sometimes. And I also have not tried that yet. It might be another interesting thing to try. Um, yeah, using DC again when you can. So I, okay, I mean, uh, I intentionally didn't use it here to keep things simple just having the simple regular GAN with the fully connected layers but in the next code example where we work with face images I will use a DC GAN so nowadays also like I mentioned before in the uh, lecture it's just called GAN because nowadays um, I mean when DC GAN was new everyone used the abbreviation DC GAN to distinguish it from the original GAN but nowadays um, convolutional GANs are so common that we don't say DC GAN we just say GAN. Uh, using stability tricks from reinforcement learning so I'm not a big reinforcement learning person so I haven't used these tricks but um, what might be useful is keeping checkpoints from the generator and discriminator that is like saving them occasionally every few epochs and then also yeah, swapping them sometimes so if things go bad swapping in the old versions could also be useful now yeah regarding the optimizer <laughs> adam rules so yeah adam is usually working most of the time well out of the box and another recommendation is using sgd for the discriminator and adam for the generator um, I think this is due to the fact that momentum may not be ideal for the discriminator because you want it to react quickly. Um, same actually also for the generator, but in practice I still find that training actually both with Adam is even better. I tried this actually and it didn't work so well, so I switched back to using Adam for both the discriminator and the generator. But again, this is something you have to try in practice. Sometimes it may work better, sometimes it may work worse. Um, track failures, uh, failures early. Okay, so, so just um, checking things. If the discriminator loss goes to zero, then that's not good. The discriminator is too strong, and then um, yeah, the generator may not be able to learn anything useful. Maybe you have to yeah see what, how you can address that. Checking the norms. So if um, the norms of the grain of the gradient norms are too large then it might also not be good. So some people also use something like a gradient penalty. We haven't talked about this yet. It might be, I mean, there's so many, infinite many things to talk about, but it's uh, another thing to keep in mind. Um, when things are working, the discriminator has a low variance and goes down over time versus having a huge variance and spiking. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, it, it goes down, I mean, it goes up and down and then it kind of stabilizes. Uh, looking actually, uh, there are no spikes. Actually looking at the value, or also the variance is relatively small compared to the generator. So that kind of looks like it's adhering to what we would expect here. Um, one thing about that is this value here is around, I would say, maybe point, point 0.5, point 0.6 something. And if you think about a random prediction around 0.5 and then you take the log of 0.5 or minus log 0.5 it should be around 
0.69, something like that. So it's actually kind of like a random prediction. So it's, it's actually quite good that it is in that range here. So for a binary prediction, 0.5, minus 0.5 should be around 0.69. So in that way, we can see, okay, this is actually close to 0.69. So it's kind of like a random prediction here, which is good. Okay. Um, if loss of generator steadily decreases, then it's fooling D with garbage. Okay. So yeah, okay, we don't have this problem here. Uh, I will show you actually a failure case uh, in the next video. Let me just double check how that, I can show it already. Mm, it's not going down, it's rather going up. But yeah, there was something interesting happening there. We will revisit that in the next video. Okay. Don't balance the loss via statistics unless you have a good reason to. So yeah, that is, uh, don't um, try to find a number of generator, number of uh, discriminator updates. Um, it usually doesn't work so well in practice. It's kind of hard just to find the, the good recommendation. If you recall, the original GAN paper uh, had a hyperparameter for the number of discriminator updates before updating um, the generator. Let's uh, go to the paper. I had a screenshot of that algorithm somewhere here yeah the k steps so here they used k equals one one might be tempted to have multiple discriminator updates before updating the generator but yeah um apparently this is probably not a great idea it's hard we've all tried it also uh, yeah following a more principled approach like checking the loss if the loss is too large or if the loss is very large, train the discriminator until it goes down. Or if the loss for the generator is too large, train it until it goes down instead of doing a fixed number of updates. Um, if you have labels, use them. So if you have labels available, train the discriminator to also classify the samples. So it's kind of like an auxiliary GAN. Actually, um, last year we worked on a paper, we actually did that here. This is, um, we used a cycle GAN. It's more of the advanced concepts, which we won't cover in this class, but um, part of it, we also had a GAN here. I mean, this is like an interesting setup. We have an autoencoder plus a GAN. So there's also the GAN aspect that we have a discriminator here. And this is uh, the generator, but it happens also be an autoencoder. So it's kind of like a hybrid. And here we also had uh, attribute classifier and an auxiliary face matcher, which are kind of like auxiliary ones. So this is really the auxiliary one, and this is uh, an additional constraint here. So it's also, yeah, might be a good idea if you have label information to include that as well. Um, it also um, brings me to the topic of how we evaluate uh, GANs. It's a kind of a tricky question. It's still an active uh, research problem. We haven't really talked about it. One is called Frechette uh, Inception Distance. And it's kind of also, yeah, it's based on essentially comparing, so many of these uh, metrics are based on comparing the distribution of the training data com uh, to the distribution of the generated data to see how similar the distributions are. And sometimes people um, also use pre-trained models. For instance, you can train, let's say, a model on, let's say, MNIST, a classifier on MNIST, and then you do the classification on the original MNIST data set, and then you do the classification on the generated data set. And you expect approximately that, uh, so the, the better the model is, the better the classifier prediction should be, because if you train the classifier on the original data set and then you show it garbage, it probably won't perform as well. The distribution of predictions will be different from the training set distribution predictions. So that, that is kind of one way to um, kind of get a feeling of how good the results are. But yeah, there are many other met metrics which are also slightly out of the scope of this class. Um, add noise to the inputs, decay over time. So adding some noise, it's kind of, I think, yeah, this is like adding noise to the layer of the generator and to the inputs. It's kind of like adding, um, if you think back of the denoising autoencoder we talked about, it's kind of like that, adding some noise to the input images train the discriminator more, so it's not sure. So yeah, there, that is like going back to the tricky part 
that we also had here in the paper, whether we should train the discriminator more times than a generator. It's a not sure thing. Batch discrimination, I actually forgot what that is. Sorry, I uh, should look this up again. Um, discrete variables. So yeah, so uh, conditional again is another topic we haven't talked about. So what you can also do is you can uh, concatenate the target variable with the input and then also feed it through the network as in a conditional setting. And then it also allows you to reconstruct. So if you, I mean, there are two, two ways to do that. Some people concatenate it with the input and then you concatenate it with the generated output and you uh, check the, sorry, you check the reconstruction also. So that's more like for an autoencoder setting, but you include essentially uh, labeling information and that can also help you to generate particular data points of a particular class if you're interested in that. And here it appears that it is also maybe a general trick that helps making GANs perform better. I haven't uh, done experiments extensively with, um, with that, but it also goes back, uh, I mean, not without it, but it also goes back to our case here where we add add this to the input, the target labels, essentially. We provide both, essentially. And this is for a different context because we want to switch um, the attributes of the image. But yeah, apparently maybe it can also help stabilizing GAN training. Using dropout both during training and testing. I have used only dropout uh, during training. Using it during testing is an interesting idea, might be something worth trying. And yeah, this is already it. By the way, uh, 17 is also my favorite and lucky number. I always uh, like to have the 17 in soccer back then, a um, long time ago. Um, but yeah, so anyways, so that is just maybe an interesting idea of things to try, some uh, initial things that work well with GANs. Notice that this is not longer maintained, but ma many of these tips are still very relevant in my opinion. All right, so in the next video, I will then talk about our DC GAN.